This is Arts Alive. I'm Linda Philippi. My guest is Charlie Glossgooder. He's a Sheridan artist who is a fabulous potter, and I can't wait for you to see his work, so let's get right into it. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. So, Charlie, I've been out to your studio a few times over the years, and mm -hmm. I know that you just told me um, that you've been on the Art Harvest Studio Tour for every year it's been in existence. Yeah, and, and actually before that, because I've been doing my own studio tour before the Art Harvest Studio Tour was in existence. So I started doing studio tours in 1981 at my home. And, and, and you've been living out in Sheridan since? That's right, since, since 19... Actually, I built my house there in 1979. So you were kind of ahead of the fabulous Sheridan curve, weren't you? Well, I was... I, I, I don't really know. <laughs> I was out there at an early time. So yeah. I think there were already some art, other artists who were living mm -hmm. out there. Uh, I think Jay Jensen was living out there prior mm -hmm. to my existence there, and Rory Seto was, was there. Okay. Um, but you have a really beautiful location. Oh, it's great. Yeah, I, I really love it. It's um, up in the hills above Sheridan, and it's close mm -hmm. to the coast, and it's close to McMinnville, and it's a, it's a great place to live, and it's an inspiration to be there and to be able to work there. Well, let's just talk a little bit about the tour. So the Art Harvest Studio Tour, mm -hmm. which is you know, produced through the Arts Alliance of Yamhill Hill County. Right. Um, it's the first two weekends in October every year. That's correct. And this year, what, maybe close to 40 artists? I think it's in the 30s this year. In the year. 30s, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But one of the things I think is true is that there are quite a few artists out in your neck of the woods. Yeah, and, and in fact, there's, there's a new one who's just down the road from me, a really great artist. Um, who will be on the tour this year, and um, I think people will really um, enjoy seeing her, Jeannie Drevis, and mm -hmm. she's, she does some phenomenal work. She came on our show not too long ago. Oh, uh -huh. So I guess for the people watching, we want to really emphasize that people need to devote a full day, at least a full day, if not, you know, two, to the artists in, out your way, because there's so many people to see. Yeah, well, there, there are a lot of people to see, and, and the West Valley is a little harder to get to out mm -hmm. where we are, but I think it's well worth the effort. Definitely. Yeah. So for people, if they're coming from others, you know, maybe more of the metro area, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a push to get out there, but so worth it. It is, and it's not just the artists. It's the, the scenery, the whole environment Absolutely. out there. There are lots of wineries out there. It's just it's, it's a fun place to be. Really beautiful. Well, let's talk a little bit about you. So you've obviously been a working artist for... You know, since the earth cooled, is that it? Uh, well, it's 40 years this year that I've okay. been making, 40 years I've been making pottery now. So you crawled out from the primordial ooze <laughs> yeah, with yeah. mud still clinging yeah, to you and yeah. you just threw it on a wheel. Yeah, well. Uh, is that it, how it went? It wasn't quite like that, okay. but, you know, I, I started out, I mean, for many years, for me, it was just something I was doing as, as an enjoyable pastime. It wasn't an occupation. It was never intended to be an occupation. In fact, I did everything I could to keep it from being an occupation. What, what were you doing back then? Well, you know, I was in my 20s and I was living in Montana at the time and um, I was doing whatever I had to to survive. Okay. So um, I had just, you know, a lot of different jobs that were all sort of interesting, but every winter everything would shut down. There'd be nothing to do except there was a little art center there where I was living, and there was a potter who was teaching classes, and that was where I got my introduction to, it was, yeah. to uh, pottery. It was something I'd always kind of wanted to, to uh, approach, and all of a sudden, I had time on my hands, Isn't it? And, and that was how I got started. Wow. So I went from that to going to a junior college where they were teaching some classes, and so and that area where I was living, which is up around Flathead Lake, was just a real hotbed for really good ceramic artists. I don't know what attracted them, but there were a lot of them there, so it was a really good influence. And I was there for three years, learning basics and just kind of, kind of, getting the, a little bit of the craft mm -hmm. into my system. And then I was invited to come out to Portland. Uh, by a family friend who had a big group studio in Portland and he had a farm out west of Portland and I was able to stay there and work at the studio and help build kilns and and so I learned another uh, a whole nother realm of the of the work and um, and then so I was there for three more years and at that point then I um, moved out to Sheridan and built my studio and have been there ever since and you built your own kiln out there and yeah I built my own kiln built my studio built my house and uh, and it's and I'm st still there. You're like Paw from Little House in the on the Prairie or something. Well, you know, it's 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 been a great experience. I mean, I love building. 
Mm -hmm. And I love working with wood, and I love working with clay, and really it's all the same thing. It's, it's all craft, and, and the one thing I've learned about it is you're either a craftsperson or you're not a craftsperson. If you are a craftsperson, everything you do, you do in a craftsmanlike way. So mm -hmm. when I build, I build like I make pots. I'm attention to detail, and there's just really a lot of relationship between those um, those two two mediums and whatever it is you do. Well, let's see some some pictures of sure. your work, and then you can talk to us a little bit about your process okay. and maybe the way it's evolved over the years because okay. I can tell that it has. Right. Well, the work I'm doing now, um, these are coil built pots. Now, these mm -hmm. are new for me. Um, I've mostly been doing prior to this. I was doing thrown pots. They were thrown on a wheel. I would do them in pieces, and I would alter the forms. Then I would add slabs to them and mm -hmm. put them back on the wheel and throw them again. And then I would carve patterns and designs in them, much like what you see on this one. But the forms are more geometric, generally speaking, mm -hmm. and a little bit tighter. The forms I'm doing now are, are strictly coil built, which is a very primitive form. They're just built from coils. And you can get these very unusual asymmetrical forms, which I really love because they're really the opposite end of the spectrum from what I have been doing, which are tighter, uh, tighter tighter, more symmetrical forms. So do you, do you use a wheel for these? I don't use a wheel for these. Okay. So basically you just start with coils and you just keep adding coils to the vessel and building the vessel up one. I'll build them up. I can really only build them up a couple inches at a time. Now this vessel is about uh, 20 inches. It was probably about 22 inches tall when I was working on it. Mm -hmm. And you can only get so far when you're coil building before the thing just just won't support its own weight. Yeah, that's and, what I'm and, thinking. Like it so, just mushes in on yeah, itself. Yeah. So really, what I'm doing is when I'm building these, I'll be doing maybe six or eight of them at a time. Every one of them different, <laughs> and every one of them at a, at, a, at a different kind of stage of um, construction. Mm -hmm. But every day, I can only go up a couple of inches. Mm -hmm. So I'll do one a couple inches, and I'll go over the next. Because one, they have, it has to harden enough. Because it's got to stiffen up enough for me to keep adding it, or or it'll just just collapse. So right. as you're building these. Um, you That's need really to get pretty. the forms, uh, you have to kind of move the forms as you're going and you have to kind of anticipate where the form's going because once that bottom part is set up, it's set up. So you can't really move it around. You can add, as you're going up, you can build onto it, but, the, but the, you can't change the form that's already stiffened up. And you can see all these forms have different designs on them. This one I used nails okay. to put that texture mm -hmm. in there. And it has a closed mouth, whereas the previous one had kind of a trumpet, mm -hmm. trumpet neck to it. And this one, again, this one's about 20 inches tall. And, and you can't see it three-dimensionally here, but it may be flatter on one side, or mm -hmm. you can see it's not a symmetrical piece. And that's what I really love about it. The colors on them, this is a copper glaze. You get a lot of variation in color in there. Really and that's pretty. really a function of the thickness of the glaze. So mm. I have no control over that, really. It just does its own... So thing. you put it, you you put it on, and then yeah. and some of it slides it down and well, off. Well, I spray and it on. Or, oh, on these, okay. I'm spraying the glaze okay. on, and once that glaze hits them, it just solidifies, dries, and you can't tell how thick it is, and so uh -huh. you don't really know where you are. But where it's thin, it'll be kind of a burnt sienna color, and then it'll go to a yellow color, and then to a light green color, then to a dark green color, and then sometimes I'll spray a little cobalt over it to be, make it even darker. This piece, again, is a goyle built piece, and I've carved that design in there mm -hmm. and added those little, those little bumps. So on this one, I've added clay as well as subtracting clay Interesting. to it. And you can see that glaze. I don't know how well your viewers can see this up close, but the glaze is, almost looks like lichen. It's, it's got this kind of crackly, mm -hmm. uh, very rough, abrasive texture to it. And it's darker where it's sunk into the cracks. Yeah, and where mm -hmm. it's thicker. So, yeah, that's really, that's beautiful. And, and when I'm doing these, I don't have a kind of, I'm not like drawing this picture out and then following this preconceived idea. It's mm -hmm. all very spontaneous. Uh, I, just, I just pull out my carving tool and start cutting. And whatever happens, happens. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so this piece is a little bit different. This piece is a thrown vessel. The bottom half up to the sharp shoulder where you can mm -hmm. see that kind of sharp mm -hmm. line, that would be one vessel that I throw. And then I squared the form up. So instead of now being round, it's a square form. Mm -hmm. Then I put a slab of clay on top and attach it and cut that slab of clay to a, a square form to match the bottom. And then I put it back on the wheel and put a little hole in the top, get my finger in there, expand the opening and throw the opening to give it a round opening. And then I throw the lid. And then after the form is built, then I go back in and carve 
that spiral design in there. I just use a carving tool. Um, this one's got a, um, is a very similar glaze to the green glaze, except it's using cobalt for that blue coloration in there that you see. That's really pretty, yeah. This one again, this one's a slab built piece, totally. So this one's not thrown at all. And this one's done with slabs of clay. And you can see that kind of fan-shaped mm -hmm. form. The sides of that piece, which are textured, start out as a flat slab on a table. And I put that, and I hammer that pattern into the clay while it's still flat. Then I cut that, that, that design, that profile. And I then a, um, take another slab and make the sides and the top for it and make the lid. So that is a totally slab built vessel. That's very interesting, all the different shapes you can get. Yeah, and then here we are back again at the coil built vessels. Again, asymmetrical. You get these kind of unusual openings, this kind of mouth mm -hmm. in the piece that are very um, unusual, irregular, and they just really give it a lot of energy. And the irregular form, again, gives it a lot of energy. They're fun to do, and they're just spontaneous. I have no idea what's going to come of them. It's just like a shot in the dark. You just do it and hope for the best. So when you're doing the coil built mm -hmm. and you're making, you just, just rub yeah, it out just, and make yeah, coils, yeah. and then you build it up. Now, so, do you, you, know, you smooth just, the sides yes. then? So, so, you know, you're just rolling out those coils like kids mm -hmm. do, except I make mm -hmm. them really long, mm -hmm. and you just start wrapping them around and around and around, and after you get to a certain point, then you, you have to smooth out all those joints between the coils. And I just right. use a, a, a paddle, and I'll paddle the outside of the, the vessel to, okay. to get it smooth while okay. I'm rubbing it from the inside, and then... I come in with a metal rib, which is just kind of a metal kidney-shaped piece of flexible metal that I'll then scrape the outside of that vessel to kind of give it some definition and form and just to kind of clean up that form. And it has to be very smooth and clean before I'll come back in and do that, that carving because I don't want the lines of the coils to interfere with the lines that I'm carving with that design. I don't want them to conflict. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I start, after the, after the form of the vessel is done, it's just a very clean, smooth, almost looks like leathery surface. And from there, then I just start carving the design. Like I say, it's all very spontaneous. It's really amazing what you're doing. Now, do you do, you do classes at all? Or? I, I don't do classes anymore. There was a time when I was offering some classes in the winter, mm -hmm. but it was just so difficult for people to come up when the, you know, in this, at that time of year. Right, when the roads are icy. Yeah, it was, just, it was just too difficult. And in the summer and spring, I don't usually make pots. So I, my cycle of work is, in the winter, is when I make pots. In the spring, I fire them. And in the summer, I'm either doing shows or I'm doing something that's totally unrelated to pottery. Um, I really don't like to work more than a couple months a year at pottery. And, and the reason is, is that I can get a lot done in that couple of months of working. I'll make maybe a hundred pieces and then I take a break from it and and during that break I have all these ideas that come right. to me. So that you know in the next winter when I come back I have all these really fresh ideas mm -hmm. and I'm really got a lot of energy that I put into them and it just makes my work very very kind of lively and fun and I don't feel like I'm having to go into a studio to make ten more pots. Right, so it, it keeps it fresh. Yeah. Well then let's just recap. So the okay. Art Harvest Studio Tour mm -hmm. is coming up the first yep. two weekends in October right. and you're also going to be doing the Corvallis Fall Festival. The Corvallis Fall Festival, which is the like weekend before. The last, the weekend, last weekend in September. September. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Well, Charlie, thank you very oh, much yeah, for coming pleasure. in, and I uh, can't wait to see your work All again. Right. Well, thanks for having me.